Hi, everyone. So I think we'll get started and people can trickle in as we're doing intros. So thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Parazad. I work for the Harvard Brain Science Initiative. And this is our first uh, Meet the Neuroscientist event on Zoom. We're very excited. Um, this started, uh, we had a summer uh, lunch series for high school students and college students working in Harvard labs in the summer. Um, and it was a lot of fun and we wanted to have an opportunity online to reach a broader audience and having a chance for um, high school and college students like you to have a chance to connect with neuroscience researchers in our community, graduate students, postdocs, faculty members and staff, and you know have a very light, open, uh, relaxed discussion forum. So that's what we hope to have today. Um, this is a series. So uh, this is first one, we'll have another one next week and hopefully many more. Um, so I'm excited today to introduce two speakers, Dr. Jasmine Escobedo Lozoya and uh, Dustin Tillman. So I'll just brief you briefly introduce them and they'll tell you a lot more about their science and their career trajectories. Um, and what we're gonna do is have um, record the talks and have a few questions after each talk, but then stop the recording and have a really open uh, Q&A uh, afterwards. So just to tell you a little about our speakers. Uh, Jasmine is a postdoctoral researcher working in the lab of Susan DeMecki, which is in the Department of Genetics at Harvard Medical School. Her research uh, explores how the properties of individual nerve cells, uh, neurons, and their interconnections contribute to circuit dynamics in the brain. Uh, a lot of her recent work is focused on neurons that communicate via the neurotransmitter serotonin. Uh, among many other topics, she studies how these neurons work um, as part of the brain's neuromodulatory systems um, and how they might be involved in the formation of reward memories. Um, and I know her from her role in a lot of community building and STEM outreach organizations. Um, and Dustin is a third year PhD student who's working in the lab of Jeff Macklis, which is in the Department of Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so his work focuses on how neurons um, grow and form connections to each other. So when neurons are born, they're spherical balls. Um, and that over time, they grow um, axons, which are projections that allow them to connect with other nerve cells. Um, and he studies that process. His investigations uh, center on two different types of neurons, which are born in the same region of the brain, but project to very different target regions. Um, and he's interested in how that might be important for understanding diseases such as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So I'll let them uh, tell you a little more about their work. Um, so yeah, I think we'll get started. Oh, and one thing I wanted to say is please feel free as people are speaking to type questions into the chat box so you remember them for later. Um, and with that, um, uh, Yasmin, would you like to get started? Uh, sure. Um, actually, um, it would be nice to run this as an ask me anything. So if any question pops into your head, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and just ask. Um, so as Paris had said, I am currently a postdoctoral fellow in the laboratory of Susan Dimecki, and I'm really interested in understanding neuromodulation in the brain. Um, what that roughly means, at least to me, is I'm trying to understand basically um, how do brain regions uh, communicate to each other? And how does the brain um, decide, let's say, which brain regions should talk to each other and when. Um, so to do that process of kind of um, dividing up a task uh, into functions that different brain regions can, uh, can do, and then reorganize the information into some kind of answer, some kind of behavior that a person or an animal could do, you need to have a series or a system of uh, essentially switches that can help uh, the brain make decisions about how that information flows around. Um, and all of these switches are uh, essentially neurons um, that are uh, regulating that information flow. And that is um, what they call neuromodulation. Um, and the way that I studied this in the lab, um, I work with mice um, and mice are species that is really great to use for these kind of experiments because over the last 50 years, we have developed a lot of uh, tools to be able to manipulate them genetically. 
Uh, and what that means for me as a neuroscientist is that I can um, essentially label neurons of different kinds really precisely in the brain. So it's as if I could use their genes as a zip code uh, that allows me to know exactly where a neuron is, sometimes even when the neuron is born and to be able to track it. Uh, and as far as I mentioned, uh, not only the um, cell body, but also um, the regions where the neuron receives information and the regions where the neuron sends out information, which are called the dendrites and the axons. And I just wanted to show you like a quick picture of what that kind of looks at, uh, hopefully it simulates some questions uh, and I'll just share my screen really quickly. Um, hopefully you're seeing some of that. Um, sorry, I need to reorganize my desktop a little bit. Uh, so what you're seeing, although it's not full sized yet, is the brainstem of a mouse in what we call a sagittal cross section. Uh, so, All right, here we go. Um, that should be full size. Um, so if this were a person, what you're looking at would be a single slice that would go through the midline uh, in this direction, right? And it would be in the human over here. This is called the brainstem. It's an area that contains a lot of really important nuclei that control many um, autonomous bodily function, like for example, respiration, cardiovascular control, uh, thermal sensation, etc. cetera. Um, but it also contains many different kinds of neuromodulatory neurons. And what you see here um, in the light uh, or gray is the cell bodies um, of many neurons that are capable of producing the neurotransmitter serotonin, which is one of the uh, main neuromodulatory systems. Um, these kind of lines that are squiggly and come out of them are uh, mostly dendrites, which is regions where they're receiving information. And in the case of the serotonin system, basically almost every brain region that you can imagine uh, sends them information uh, they receive it, they process it, um, and then they send out information uh, back out that allows the brain to regulate its own information flow. Um, and I study a particular class of serotonin neurons that in this um, picture would be located roughly around here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, and the really cool thing about these, or one of the things I love about them is so they send out these really, 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 really long, long projections into regions that are much farther away, as far away as the cortex, which again, in the human, it would be all the way over here. Um, in this case, what I'm showing you is not the ones that go to the cortex, but the ones that go to a different region, which is called the lateral septum. And so what I'm, you're seeing here is a fluorescent mic microscopy image, a fluorescent microscopy reconstruction. And these dots that are magenta are lighting up one kind of a connection that the brain makes, um, which is called glutamate. And these other dots that are green are the neurons that I study uh, making their connections specifically with this one uh, cell, which I know it's there because I have a marker, which is over here in blue, that allows me to label the nucleus of that cell. So I can see that they're making these, um, they're encasing these, these other uh, neurons with their axons to send them information. And if you reconstruct them, you can see something that we call a basket. Um, so what I study in the lab is both at the uh, molecular and microscopic level, how do these two structures communicate, but also at the level of the, of the entire brain using all the techniques, um, what happens when these neurons are activated and how do they modulate the information flow? Um, okay, I'm gonna stop my share and um, I, I've been doing this over the last uh, three years or so, uh, give or take the pandemic. Um, and the way I got interested in these questions was throughout my PhD work, I did a lot of um, experiments in which I was looking at information flow in more local circuits with a technique called electrophysiology, which allows you to just measure the electrical signals that flow from those um, little dots that you saw, the axons, 
to the connected neurons. Um, and so I wanted to understand kind of like the larger picture of within the whole brain, how does the information flow? Um, I'm not sure if Paris had mentioned, uh, but so I did my PhD at Brandeis University, which is just kind of down the river that away. Um, and uh, before that, I um, studied my undergrad at the National University uh, of Mexico, which is called UNAM. And that was the first time I, I got to do um, electrophysiology and I got to learn about neuroscience and I got really fascinated by all these questions. Um, and even before that, I was in a small um, kind of town in Mexico or small at the time, it's grown a lot, uh, which is called Sinaloa or Culiacan. Um, and probably it was when I was around your age that I started having these questions of, you know, how do we think and why are we curious and how do brains, um, how do brains make thoughts essentially, right? Um, I started to, you know, come up with ways or, 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 or try to ask myself, what kind of career would I have to study uh, in order to be able to answer these kinds of questions and um, how could I get there, right? Um, so I think that what you're doing here is pretty important, just exploring and being able to ask questions and, you know, thinking about what is exciting or fun about your day and how could you make that into something that becomes your career? Uh, I think it's a really fun and exciting time um, to be in that you guys are in. Um, and I'm, you know, happy to answer any questions about any of that or my trajectory or any questions you may have that I can answer. Um, but I'll pass it over to Dustin, and maybe after that we can um, we can get into the questions. Yeah, that sounds great. Let me just pull up my. I have a couple of slides as well. Um, but yes, thanks. Thanks to all of you all for coming. Um, it's really exciting to talk to folks about both the science that I'm doing right now, but then also sort of the path I took to get here. Um, in particular, because I, I did not know anything about neuroscience before I started my PhD. And so this has been a really steep learning curve for me. And so hopefully um, I can share that part of the story because for me anyway, neuroscience was a little bit intimidating to even think about um, kind of as a thing to research. Um, and so the way I have my slides today is the first couple of minutes, I want to talk a little bit about my journey to get to where I am, starting from, you know, my hometown in California, going to school, and then ending up here in Boston. Um, and then for the later bits, I have some slides about the research I'm doing right now. Um, and that research, broadly speaking, is how proteins and growth cones uh, regulate formation of precise neural circuitry. Um, and so none of those words are super important right now, and I'll explain them all as we, we go through today. Um, but so I want to start by talking about my hometown a little bit, which is uh, Davis, California. It's also known as Cowtown because there used to be more cows than people. Um, that's no longer true, thank goodness, but it's, it's, a, it's a small small town in Northern California, um, home to UC Davis, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, and the main way I spent my time in Davis, California growing up was watching a TV show called House MD. Um, I love this TV show. I watched it with my mom. This was back in the day when Netflix would send you DVDs in the mail. And so I watched this all the time. Um, and I think my mom wanted me to become a doctor after watching this show. Um, and I, and I think I, I, part of me really did, right? Um, for those of you who don't know, the show is about a team of doctors who treat patients with really mysterious diseases. Um, and it's sort of like a detective show. They have to figure out what's wrong with the patient and treat them before things go too badly. Um, and I watched this show. I, I really liked it. I wanted to be like Dr. House one day. Um, but then I realized as I talked to doctors and uh, people doing other careers that the job Dr. House has is not a very common job. Most doctors are doing other things with their time. And medicine's awesome, right? I have friends doing medicine. They're doing great things. Um, but it didn't scratch that itch that um, I was really interested in. Um, and instead, that idea of you know, a patient comes in with some mysterious disease, you have to perform various tests, create a hypothesis and see if it's true, and then hopefully help a person's life. Um, I found, I thought that that idea could be found in the world of science, um, because a lot of what we do is we look at the world, we see kind of weird things going on, we ask questions about them, try to understand why they're happening, and then see if our uh, predictions are correct. Um, the actual process is a lot messier than what I just described, but kind of that ideal is something I was really interested in. 
Um, and so I, I left Davis and I went to St. Louis for college, um, so kind of moving east over uh, to St. Louis here, um, where I studied biology and chemistry. And one of the big questions I had knowing I wanted to do science was what area of science did I find most interesting? Um, and for me, it wasn't neuroscience, not at all. I couldn't care less about the brain at the time. Um, for me, it was proteins, getting really down to the molecular level of what are the molecules in biology that are important for life in a cell. Um, and so as I'm sure all of you know, right, we kind of think of there being four different types of molecules. There's carbohydrates, lipids, nucleic acids, and my favorite proteins. Um, and what I like so much about proteins, is uh, this movie, I'm sure some of you have seen it too, it, it, it's really cool, right? It's like this protein, this motor protein carrying along some cargo, and it looks kind of goofy. It's like clomping along down this track. And I saw this movie in my intro bio class, and I thought it was awesome. Um, and I really wanted to understand how does this protein work and how do proteins broadly do their jobs in a cell? Um, I was really fortunate to have the chance to do some undergraduate research with Bob Trams at, in college. Um, and what we did is we investigated a particular protein that transports heme from inside of the cell to outside of the cell. Um, the details aren't important here at all. I just want to show a quick movie because um, I think it looks cool. And I think it kind of highlights some of the cool stuff about proteins, right? So we have this molecule called heme moving from inside the cell and pushing this other molecule of heme up through the protein. And then what you'll notice is as that second molecule of heme rises up, the protein kind of opens and that allows the heme to be transported from inside the cell to outside the cell. Um, and so this was a question I studied a lot in college and I really enjoyed the work. And so I um, left college to do my PhD thinking that I would stick with proteins and that would be my main focus going forward. Um, so kind of you know, finishing my journey east up here at Harvard for my PhD. Um, but during orientation week for my program, my now boss, Jeff Maclis, gave a really cool seminar about the work he was doing in his lab um, in neuroscience. And I thought I had the opportunity to kind of bridge the work I did in undergrad on proteins with the work he's doing in the lab and the work we're doing right now, um, which is looking at uh, proteins and growth cones. And so I'm going to transition now from kind of my scientific journey to the work I'm doing now in the lab. Um, and the first thing I learned about the brain, and I think the most important thing about the brain, is just how unbelievably complex it is, sort of impossible to imagine, staggeringly complex. Because um, we look at this image of a brain, you know, and it looks complicated enough as is, right? There's sort of these ridges, there's these canyons, it, there's probably different areas of the brain that do different things. Um, but this superficial image is hiding so much complexity. Um, so like, this is, I think, a really cool artistic image of what the brain looks like. And it's showing each of these different colors as a different cell in the brain. And it gives you some idea of just how much complexity is there. But even this image, it shows 500,000 cells in the brain. And a real brain has 80 billion cells, 80 billion neurons. Um, and so even this really intricate, beautiful picture is nowhere close to capturing just how complicated and complex each of our brains are. Um, and so this is a question we're trying to unpack a little bit in, in my lab. And we're not, not trying to address it all at once, but we're kind of zooming in on individual neurons to try and understand how they can form connections to wire up the brain. Um, and so a neuron is just a cell in the brain. That its main job is to transmit information between different regions of the nervous system. Um, and so here's kind of a cartoonish image of what a neuron might look like, where we have the soma or the cell body over here on the left. This is where the nucleus of the neuron is. It's kind of the control center, you could say. Um, we have this region of the neuron called the axon. It's kind of like an electrical wire. This is what allows connections to be made between different regions of the brain in order to transmit information. And over at the end here, we have my favorite part, the growth cone. Um, and I'll talk a lot more about growth cones in a couple of slides, but the important thing to know right now is that the main job of the growth cone is to ensure that neurons form appropriate connections with each other. And neurons form a lot of connections with each other. Um, neurons can form thousands of connections with each other. So that, that image I was showing earlier of just a single neuron in isolation is not how neurons look like in the brain. Um, this is a much more accurate representation of what a neuron might look like. Where we have our main cyan neuron right here, but all these other different colors are other neurons that are forming connections with this one neuron in cyan. And as you can imagine, right, all of these other different colored neurons are also forming thousands of connections with other neurons. And so it's this really complicated 
uh, jungle of neurons that at least trillions of connections being present in the brain. Um, once again, it's kind of illustrating just how complex this organ is. Um, like I said, we're not going to worry about the complexity today. We're going to zoom in and kind of focus on individual neurons and try and understand how they form connections. Um, and the way they do this is, as I mentioned, growth cones. Um, and the main job of the growth cone is to regulate axon extension. Um, so like Parzad mentioned in the very beginning, uh, a neuron isn't born with any connections. Instead, it's born with a soma or cell body, a teeny tiny axon just beginning to extend away from the neuron, and a growth cone right here at the tip. And what this growth cone will do is as the axon extends through the developing brain, it will guide the axon and make sure the neuron goes to the correct location and forms appropriate connections. Um, and even though this process is really important for the brain to form correctly, we still don't know a lot about how growth cones work. One thing we do know, though, is that they, were, they work by responding to different molecules in their environment. Um, so there, this is like a, a video that's going to loop over a couple of times showing a growth cone moving in a petri dish. So we have this axon right here that's slowly extending along, and you can notice the growth cone um, kind of like exploring its environment, right? It's extending tendrils in different directions, looking for chemicals and molecules that will tell it where to go. And the really cool thing about this video is that the white rectangle over here on the top, right, um, has an attractive chemical inside of it called netrin. And so what the growth cone does is you'll notice when it detects that netrin present, it zooms up to the top right of our screen, kind of demonstrating that the growth cones are looking for these guidance molecules that tell them how to move around in the brain. And what's really remarkable is that these growth cones can respond to all of these different attractive and repulsive cues in a brain to build really intricate and precise circuitry. Um, and so in our lab, in Jeff's lab, we study a couple of different circuits and we're asking questions about how do these neurons form these circuits correctly? Um, and how can we mess up these neurons to have the circuits form correctly? So here are the three different circuits that our lab studies. Uh, the names aren't important at all, what I want you all to take away is that each of these different types of neurons is in a different color. And you'll notice that their cell bodies or their somata are in a very similar region of the brain, the cerebral cortex. But their axons are extending to totally different locations, right? They're extending over to this region of the brain, down to the thalamus, or even down to the spinal cord here for circuits of all the location. And so the question I'm trying to answer is what is different between these neurons? And in particular, what's different between growth cones of these neurons that allows them to form these really distinct and different circuits? And my hypothesis, and something that has um, some support in the field, is that it's those molecules I studied in undergraduate that are important for this process, proteins. Um, and so my big hypothesis is that there will be different proteins in different types of growth cones that allow different types of circuits to form. And so you can imagine a world where we have these different attractive and repulsive chemical cues binding to membrane proteins like the ones I worked on in undergrad, but then activate this huge network of proteins that change how the growth cone uh, adapts to these different environmental molecules. Um, and so what I'm studying in Jess lab is trying to identify which proteins are present in growth cones and in these different types of neurons that allow them to form these different circuits. And one really cool piece of evidence that I'll close with uh, suggesting that proteins are so important is the fact that we can mutate proteins in growth cones, and this causes axons to go to the wrong place. So if you imagine like before, we have a normal version of the protein, and so the axon will extend like normal. It'll go maybe up towards the top of the screen. But what we've seen is if you mutate a particular protein that's only found in growth cones, that axon now extends to a totally different location. So in this example, maybe down to the bottom of the screen. And so this is just one more piece of evidence suggesting um, that maybe it's proteins and growth cones that are responsible for these different circuits being formed. And that's, that's what I'm trying to study in my PhD. Um, uh, so yeah, that's, that's all I have. Uh, thanks for, for listening. And yeah, I guess uh, Jasmine and I would be happy to take, answer any questions about our, how we got where we are or what we're doing now and all that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you both so much for the wonderful talks. So we'll just stop this recording.